These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Up until now, our story has concerned itself almost exclusively with a single class of inhabitants in the ancient Near East. Now, we can hardly be faulted for focusing almost exclusively on this class, with only the barest peripheral mentions of other classes of occupants of this region, since these are those who actually did all the writing, a privileged class, more capable than others, and often quite explicitly in charge of the other classes, defining where and how they could live. Sometimes the other classes would threaten those who wrote history, but this was infrequent, and let's be honest, it's deeply condemned in the written texts that have come down to us for how dare the lesser orders attack their betters. This privileged class is, of course, humans, and the mostly ignored group is all the other animals that walked, swam, flew, slithered, and crawled across the Mesopotamian plains. I got a listener question some months back asking about the relations between animals and humans in the ancient world. And I, at that moment, just happened to be reading a book about the history of animals in the ancient world. And also, I really like animals, so you're getting this episode. I don't know how it's going to turn out. But how do we go through all the animals in a coherent way? I suppose I could list animals in alphabetical order using the modern English language, something that modern reference books, in fact, do for ease of use. But if you'll remember from a few weeks ago, the ancient Mesopotamians did not have alphabetical order because, of course, they didn't have an alphabet. Despite that, they had a ton of lists, and these were ordered in ways that involved category distinctions, culturally based notions of priority, and analogy to put together a list ordering that made sense to the ancient mind. I personally have no idea how to navigate the ancient mind to try and put a list together like that, but fortunately, I was able to find a pretty extensive 600 item lexical list organized on the topic of animals. Now, part of me wants to sit here and read every single item from this lexical list with a bit of commentary, and indeed I kind of want to read off all of these topical lexical lists and talk about them for endless mind-numbing hours. There are a ton of these lists. Students would just make them, hey, write down every word you know related to trees, and they'd write them all down. Oh, it's fantastic! But I get the feeling that no one wants to listen to that. By the way, if anyone does actually want to hear the full contents of lexical lists read out with commentary, contact the show over at oldeststories.net because I would totally do those as special episodes if anyone was actually interested. But that is beside the point. Though this list may be hundreds of items long, from a modern perspective, we can compress it a fair bit. For example, the first 122 items of the list, I put them in Excel format so I could count them very easily, are all the different ways to write different kinds of sheep. There's a word or a phrase, really, for white sheep, for brown sheep, for speckled sheep, for dead sheep, for sheep with arthritic hips, for sheep used as bait for a wolf, for sheep that had a miscarriage, for sheep with diarrhea, for sheep given as a gift to a king, for sheep given as a gift to a god, for sheep eaten by a wolf, for sheep eaten by a lion, for sheep eaten by a god. I really, I really could go on. Just looking through these lists, the things which they wrote down in these lexical lists, which they considered as different relevant kinds, as different states that were useful, not just for a scribe to know, but for a scribe to be able to distinctly write down and work with throughout his career, it reveals a lot more about how they categorized the world than I think I managed to convey in that episode on Esagil Kinapli. But more relevant for us today is the fact that, as far as most of us are concerned, that 122 entries about different words for sheep really just collapses down into one big entry 
that being sheep. And it is perhaps no surprise that sheep are both first on this list and involve the most elements in the list. Sheep were massively important in the ancient world, perhaps more than I've made clear on the show up until now. My focus has always been on agriculture because we know that that's the avenue through which civilization was really made possible. But while sheep are often the iconic product of the more transient, marginally civilized tribes, that doesn't mean that the Mesopotamians turned their noses up at sheep. Indeed, sheep were ubiquitous, and when we get households wealthy enough to have their goods listed down, so middle class and up, generally speaking, we very frequently find that they own some quantity of livestock, and most commonly, that's sheep. And sheep are great. You can eat them. You can pluck their hair for wool. You can drink their milk. They're relatively uniform enough to use as currency. And unlike gold coins, you don't have to carry them. They carry themselves. In fact, they're great for taking out to war because you've got a mobile food supply. They're fantastic. And though it's rarely mentioned or studied for obvious reasons, sheep appear to be the preferred animal for man-beast intimacy whenever they're available, due to their advantages both anatomical and behavioral in that area. This is naturally a difficult thing to estimate objectively, but I've seen some estimates that peg this sort of thing as being more common than polite society likes to discuss. Though, of course, being common does not mean it was acceptable at any point, at least in Mesopotamian history. Unnatural matters aside, every part of the sheep lifestyle would have been directly observed and interacted with by most ancient Mesopotamians through the course of their childhood and adult lives. It is always clear what happened in the largest cities with their animals, but in the villages where most people lived, it's often the case that people would sleep with the animals, either in the same room or often in the same bundle of bodies, cuddling against the cold and lonely nights. Jared Diamond was famously very excited by old worlders sleeping with their livestock because of the effects it had in disease transmission, Namely, it generated a ton of diseases and still does in modern history, with pretty much every modern disease panic in my own lifetime having zoological origin. But while sheep are undoubtedly the most economically favored and numerically common animal, at least mammal, in ancient Mesopotamia, to the extent that if you're imagining pretty much any scene from the ancient world without sheep, at least somewhere in the background, you're probably doing it wrong. It's hard to talk about them without also talking about goats. Now, goats were domesticated about the same time, though, in fact, they may have been slightly earlier. There's very little that a sheep can do, which a goat can't also do. Now, generally, goats can graze in more challenging conditions than sheep can manage, but the products are often considered inferior, and many goats are not suitable for textile production at all. Still, for the agriculturalist of the lowlands, both sheep and goats provide something that's chronically lacking in agriculture, economic stability. A grain farmer can take a single harvest a year, and that crop has to last until the next harvest, a full year later. That's a lot of uncertainty. Anything could happen in that year. You've already taken your one-year income. Who knows what's going to happen? Having sheep and goats to provide dairy and meat, potentially year-round, should it be needed, that alleviates a lot of that pressure and provides a lot of nutrients that grain alone will not. Of course, as central as sheep and goats are to the settled Mesopotamian, they're even more crucial to the pastoralist, many of whom have had milk as their staple food just as surely as barley was the staple for their settled counterparts, with butter, cheese, yogurt, and the occasional meat to diversify things a bit. But being so central to the lives of both farmer and herdsman, sheep and goats are in the background of ancient life in ways that are really hard for us to imagine nowadays. 
They're so central to life on Earth that when the gods have a message to pass to the human realm, they often do so through messages divined in a sheep or goat liver. Every part of the animal was used after death, and while still alive, they were productive in a variety of ways, not just milk and wool, but used for heat on cold nights as well. Like I said, you all cuddle together. But unfortunately, despite their ubiquity, there's really not a whole lot more to say about sheep and goats. They were there, and they were important economically, culturally, and religiously, but there's so much in the background that they're often neglected by our written sources. And while they do show up in art, they're much less interesting than other animals. Which brings us down our lexical list to the next type of animal. Around the 175th item, we get past the goats, lambs, the kids, into the cattle. And heading the list of cattle are a number of terms related particularly to bull oxen. Now, oxen were massive, about the largest living thing most Mesopotamians would ever see in their lives, and packed more muscle power in their huge frames than nearly anything else they could compare to. Nowadays, a John Deere combine harvester costs about half a million dollars. Oxen in those days were about as common as combine harvesters are today. Which is to say they're not particularly rare, but they're still an impressive sight, and even a grown man might pause at it from time to time driving down the highway or puttering down your old dirt roads going from one Mesopotamian town to another. Now, the ox pulled plows, a crucial technology for opening up the hard-packed soil of Mesopotamia, and they were given the care and attention of a high-dollar tractor nowadays. During the season, when it was time to work, they were worked hard, rented out to field after field. But at the same time, our ancient farming manuals are very careful to tell us that the oxen were never overworked just as they weren't allowed to slacken beneath capacity. They were the workhorses, so to speak, the industrial machinery of Mesopotamian agriculture, requiring a lot of investment and putting in the work to be worth it. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the ox, and this departs from our lexical list here, is that they are often in art and literature paired with lions as twin symbols of masculine power. Kings throughout history were metaphorically both bulls and lions, the two each representing the peak of muscle power for two different spheres of activity. The lion, of course, is the top predator of the natural world and used to be common enough around the Mesopotamian region that most common folk would have a good sense of how actually frightening these can be up close. Even seeing a lion in a modern zoo, if you're able to get close enough to comprehend the muscle power involved, even as the giant cats just pace around, you could start to imagine how it would feel if that huge animal was stalking your livestock, or worse, eyeing your children as they play in the, by the canal. Now, the symbolism of the lion is still with us pretty strongly today, but the idea of an ox being uniquely powerful has sort of fallen away. After all, the power of the ox is an industrial power, a domestic power, and just in my driveway I own a machine that dwarfs even the largest ox in terms of sheer weight and size and, of course, power, and larger industrial machines are common enough that they go generally unnoticed by most people. Similarly, oxen were also prized symbolically and economically for their virility, their ability to impregnate cows, and the ability to generate pregnancy is just not as highly valued or culturally prioritized as it was in the days when people introduced themselves with their genealogies. And so when we see oxen in royal symbology, when we hear about someone hiring an ox team to plow, we should probably adjust our inner associations from hearing large male cattle to hearing tireless power and virility. 
And by the way, for those of you who have already started to get worried about the distinction between oxen and bulls, where oxen are the castrated animal and bulls are the one that can actually breed, it's quite different to distinguish the two in the ancient record. And most texts that I've seen use them interchangeably in most contexts. And some even talk about oxen directly as breeders. Certainly, if they were castrating their ancient cattle, the ancients would have been aware of the difference, but unless they draw, you know, a huge dongle in the art, we can't tell their representations apart nowadays. And so, we can't really say how different a bull and an ox were in ancient times. But the subject of bulls draws us naturally to the subject of cows, about which there's sadly little to say. Cattle are, in general, usually the third most common animal in ancient communities after sheep and goats. And by the dawn of history, they're already fully domesticated, used for meat, dairy, and hides. The ancient ancestor of cattle, the aurochs, had probably not com gone completely extinct yet, but they weren't used for anything. They were just a hazard of the wilderness to be hunted by those who were prepared and avoided by everyone else. Now, in many religions, certain animals get strongly associated with certain deities. Over in Egypt, many of the gods wore animal heads sometimes. In Greece, each god had a sacred animal. And in India, cattle became so associated with Brahma that they don't eat beef. In Mesopotamian religion, this was much less of a factor. All the gods would own flocks of all the domesticated animals, which in practice were property of the temple, used the same way as a private landholder would, buying and selling and consuming, with the difference that all the consumption would first be in the form of sacrifices to the gods, and then that sacrificed meat would go on to feed the temple workers once the god had been satisfied. Similarly, the gods all seemed quite happy to communicate with the earth via omens through a large number of animals, both domestic and wild. There were some gods with particularly prestigious earthly flocks. For example, in Sippar, the temple of Shamash's horses were all tended to with implements of gold and silver while at the temple of Asher, in Asher, they were quite proud of their white horses. But no animal seems to have been exclusive in this regard. But what the gods did have was mounts. Some more were like familiars more than mounts. For example, the storm god Adad rode a bull, while Ishtar, Ishtar rode a lion. Shamash rode a horse, a Reshkigal of the underworld either rode red ants or she used them as messengers. The top gods wore, rode mythical beasts. Marduk had his dragon, Ninurta was on the Anzu bird, Ea was on his goatfish, with the, which the Greeks later named Capricorn. Now we're not going to cover mythical beasts today, though honestly there's more written about those than about the real animals, and I've sort of rambled away from my point anyway, so we're going to go back to our listing of animals, and we come next to the equids section. Now, most of this is donkeys, but mixed in are words for equids in general, which is sort of like vague relatives of donkeys and horses, and it has a single word that means horse. Now, this particular list is from the old Babylonian period. I can't give you a specific date or even a reign for you, but likely the middle or later period. And so it makes sense that of the 24 different words signifying equids, most are donkeys, maybe five are hybrids, onagers, or some other kind of equid, and only one is horse, what with the horse being so new in the region. All equids occupy essentially the same economic and social role. They carry things and they pull carts. There was a time in my life when I had no car, and I lived about a quarter mile away from my favorite grocery store, and when you spent a lot of time carrying things by hand or even in backpacks and other contrivances, you soon come to appreciate things which will carry your stuff for you, particularly if you're going over longer distances, like between cities or from farm to market. 
especially with donkeys. These are cheap enough to be relatively ubiquitous, cheap enough for a modest-sized landholder to maintain his own donkey if he wants it, and pretty commonly rented out by transporters who maintain a small stable of donkeys and carts. But on the other hand, the economic gains, while definitely there in many situations, were also fairly modest. In medieval logistic studies, people talk about the tyranny of the wagon equation. Now, let's say you're transporting grain to the market, or you're transporting an army to an enemy city. Everything that can help you move grain from one place to another also eats grain. In ancient Mesopotamia, your two land-based options are people with baskets or donkeys pulling carts, both of which will eat a certain amount of grain each day. Now, in medieval Europe, the rule of thumb is that a cart full of grain will be completely eaten by the animals pulling that cart after 10 days of travel. This not only sets a hard limit on how far you can go with your crops, it also adds about 10% per day of land-based travel to the cost of your cartload, or alternatively means that the farmer is losing 10% of his total wealth every day. Now, this number may have been different in ancient Mesopotamia. Land was flatter, donkeys eat less than horses, but on the other hand, donkeys are slower, and the average cart was much smaller and heavier than in medieval Europe. But I don't know that we have the data available to estimate logistical costs as reliably as we do in Roman and medieval Europe. And the general idea here is what's important. While transport could and often did proceed by canal and riverway at much reduced price, this alternative style of transportation only reduced the value of equids where waterways were available. In short, equids of all kinds turned land-based transportation from something that was incredibly slow and difficult and expensive into something that was still really slow and difficult and expensive, though a bit less so. The horse itself, though, now that was a game changer, but mostly for warfare. We see the power of the horse first in the Kassite invasions of Babylonia. Now, similarly to how horse archers are often represented in video games, it seems that the military of Babylon was simply unable to even touch those very first Kassite horse-drawn chariots. They were just too fast. Eventually, they got some tactics to help counter horses, and more importantly, they got horses of their own, but this was almost exclusively a military technology in the Bronze Age. Horses were expensive to keep and breed and raise, and there were surprisingly few of them. In the late Bronze Age, we hear of whole empires, the Hittites and Babylonians, maintaining royal herds in the low thousands. Now, that's plenty for the army, but that's not co enough for common industrial usage. And their status as military technology seems to have had them die often enough that actually growing those herds took a lot of both money and peacetime, something that wasn't always plentiful. Now, it wasn't only kings who raised horses, but at no time in Mesopotamian history does it seem to have been common to own a horse outside of the wealthy nobility. Now, we'll be talking more about horses when we get to the Neo-Assyrian military revolution, which also was still, even at that late date, mostly an infantry thing, but for now, they can mostly be ignored except as a highly prestigious chariot-pulling beast. And while we're on the topic of horses and such, it seems that the wider Near East may have known about zebras, though apparently they are apparently impossible to domesticate, and they were ignored when they weren't just hunted. And between hunting and habitat displacement, they went from rare to extinct at some point in the ancient times. Another similar animal that also doesn't show up in our word listing is the camel. The camels of the Near East, they're the single humped ones, not the two humped camels of Central Asia. And I never knew this before, but apparently camels aren't actually good at storing water. That giant hump is a fat reserve. 
they have no, like, spare water bags inside their body. Instead, they have a number of desert adaptations to reduce their water intake and just have more durable internal organs to the degree that they can lose as much as 25% of their body water before suffering dehydration symptoms. While for a human, that number is closer to 10 or 12%, or if you're a pansy like me, that's probably like 2% and I'm done. Anyway, fun facts aside, camel domestication was occurring somewhere in the depths of the Arabian Peninsula through the Bronze Age. Wild camels were known about and presumably hunted by those who lived on the edge of the desert, but there were no domestic cam domesticated camels anywhere civilized until after 1200 or 1000 BCE and the Arabs almost certainly did not have the animals fully domesticated even at that point. After that point, they seem to have become popular rather quickly among nomads and those traveling the edge of the desert, but they don't seem to have made a huge impact on the settled regions. Now next in our old Babylonian game of Old MacDonald is our first non-domesticated animal, the snake. Our scribe records 23 different kinds of snakes, which seem to be mostly all different snake species. For comparison, with the domesticated animals, a lot of those words were status words. So, a she-donkey had one word, then another word for a pregnant donkey, and another word for a donkey that had given birth, and so on. These are culturally significant, but they can describe the same donkey at different times. With snakes, though, the main differentiator appears to be species. There is something that gets translated as stone snake, and naira snake, and dust snake, and snake of the reba plant, and blind snake, and even mythical snakes like the snake with seven heads, and the Ushimugalu dragon, which was a kind of snake listed right alongside the mundane types. Snakes represented the underworld pretty universally across Near Eastern cultures. We talked about the Hurrian snake Ilyanka in a bonus episode between episodes 47 and 48, which was like two years ago now. But economically, snakes were nothing but pests. We have a number of magical prayer incantations which were reputed to ward off snakes, and whether this was effective or not tells us how much they liked snakes. After snakes come dogs, and how dogs were treated in the ancient Near East is surprisingly difficult to get a solid handle on. On a surface level reading, people seem to hate dogs in the ancient Near East. Hittite laws consider it desecration for dogs to enter into kitchens and temples. In Babylon, pretty much anything a dog could do, touch, or stand in was an ill omen. Every period of Akkadian language magic that we have records for seems to include magic to make dogs go away. There's a famous diatribe in which a later scribe writing in classical Sumerian, a good 45 lines full of insults for someone he doesn't like very much, which is headed with the line, He is completely the seed of a dog, the offspring of a wolf. Of course, calling someone the son of a female dog is not a compliment today, but someone who reads these texts could come away with the impression that dogs were absolutely despised in the ancient world. At the same time, though, Mesopotamian art has a good number of depictions of dogs living side by side with people, sometimes as hunting or war dogs, sometimes just in the same scene in a neutral or vaguely positive fashion, like Maybe they're pet dogs. We're not really sure. Assyrian rulers, particularly in the late period, appear quite proud of their dogs. And while dog burials are far more common in Egypt and the Levant, they appear to have been enough to say that the, at least occasionally dogs were included in the family of wealthy individuals. Most shockingly, the goddess Gula, healer of humanity, seems to have loved dogs, and Gula temples are often filled with dog figurines offered to the goddess in hopes of gaining her favor or attention. Now, perhaps the takeaway from all this is that 
even though on this show we often say things like, oh, Mesopotamians did this, or Mesopotamians liked this, or Mesopotamians, oh, they thought like this. But all in all, it seems quite likely that Mesopotamians were as divided on dogs as we are today. Some kept pet dogs, some despised dogs on a moral level, and the great majority were likely somewhere in between. That said, the average opinion of dogs appears to have been colored by the fact that wild dogs were in fact dangerous to children and animals, and even to adults in some situations. And perhaps a low-level recognition of how unhygienic dogs are, with so many of the poor dog-related omens and laws being associated with places that would otherwise be clean if the dog wasn't standing nearby. Now, one bit of trivia is that badgers were, in the Akkadian language, called dogs of the earth, though whether that was poetry or belief that badgers and dogs were somehow related, that's hard to tell. But the natural pairing for dogs, in our mind, as in the ancient Babylonian mind, is cats. Wild cats get just a few mentions on our list, just one for each major species, except the lion, which gets a name for the lion, the lioness, and the roaring lion. Domestic cats, however, get only a single mention, likely because they're extremely rare in Mesopotamia at this point, and I should probably skip it because this isn't an Egypt podcast, but I like cats, so we're going to talk about it. Cat domestication is hard to trace archaeologically, but unsurprisingly, it originates in Egypt and may have been a lot later than we often think. Now, there's who, who some, there's some who contend that the transition didn't actually occur until the centuries of the Middle Bronze Age in Egypt, corresponding to the Middle Kingdom, and that it was not until the New Kingdom when the Egyptian fascination with specifically domesticated cats as opposed to lions and wild cats really took off, and perhaps not even until solidly in the Iron Age when cats went from being prestige pets of nobles and priests to commonly beloved among all Egyptian people. All of which suggests that they weren't domesticated originally for their value in controlling pests, which is the usual assumption, but for religious and emotional reasons, which would be fascinating if true, but that's not a universally held theory by any means. Anyway, this may explain why cats didn't get exported out of Egypt until a few centuries after the end of the Bronze Age. The Levant may have had them a bit earlier, but they arrive in Crete around 900, in Greece around 600, and in China around 200 BCE. Now, the rest of the world seems to have accepted cats quite happily, though no one else seems to have worshipped them until the modern era, when the internet was invented in order to produce cat pictures and videos on a scale never before seen in human history. Continuing down our list, we have one entry for otters who lived in the rivers, and one entry each for male and female monkeys. I actually can't figure out what kind of monkey this is supposed to be, but it might be the Hamadrius baboon, which nowadays lives in the southwest Arabian Peninsula and Egypt, or it could be Indian monkeys from the now very low volume trade with the Indus Valley, because there's not any indigenous monkey type in that area. Anyway, we're now pretty solidly in the miscellaneous category of wild animals, but up next are a bunch of wild deer, wild sheep, wild goats, and similar huntable animals. And hunting, by the way, that's sort of an interesting thing. We know that hunting definitely occurred. Nobles brag about their impressive hunting, and nomadic peoples of all sorts made hunting an integral part of their lifestyle. The big question I have, which I haven't found an answer to, is how often did your average Babylonian farmer go out hunting? Now, wild animals attacking regular people was apparently a, maybe a fairly common occurrence, uh, enough that 
pretty much anyone outside the city proper might need a spear or a bow to fight off whatever came into your family fields. And this sort of defensive kill would certainly have been incorporated into the family dinner. But did regular settled folk go out to hunt deer and wild animals to supplement their diets? On one hand, basic logic tells us that they, I mean, they could have, maybe they should have, but very little evidence survives to tell us about it. If it was a dangerous activity to go into the wilds, why don't we have a bunch of surviving prayer or magical incantations for peasant hunters? Or was the terror of the wilds, plus the low expected economic value of hunting, so significant that hunting was mostly off the table for most farmers? I have no idea. Anyway, hunting was mostly done with bow and arrow, or sometimes sling and rock, and less often with spear and knife. Hunting for food was often a matter of trapping, though the forms of ancient traps have not survived to modern times, while hunting for prestige among kings and the like was more akin to the sport hunting of the early modern era, where a bunch of people and dogs go out and flush out and direct the prey towards a kill zone where the important people could claim the kills and get on that high scoreboard. Live capture was also possible with nets and ropes, though I haven't seen reference to this outside the Assyrian zoos and other similar kingly prestige products. I should also note that there were elephants, bears, hippos, and a pretty wide variety of pretty rare large animals, which we don't hear about much except when they're slaughtered or captured by various royal courts. Now next on the list we get a bunch of insects, most of which are literally called either parasite or pest of one variety or another. Interestingly, locusts, which from time to time would generate famines, are not called either parasite or pest, but get their own name. This may be because grilled grasshopper was actually a delicacy. As much as they were hated for their destructive swarms, they don't taste too bad. I actually ate one once in Thailand. It isn't bad, and with a good sauce or marinade, it could potentially be rather flavorful. Fun fact, crustaceans, another type of tasty insect, was called the locust of the sea. And the only connection I can think of is the fact that both are edible insects. After the parasite index, insects come a few types of rodent, which have no social role except as a pest. Then come lizards and turtles, which could be eaten, though it seems not often, or at least we don't see it talked about more than occasionally. After that, the list talks about pigs, well separated from all the other domestic animals. Pigs were raised for food, but they had a very low social status. In one text, it explicitly states that slaves don't deserve real meat. Only pig meat is miserable enough for them. It isn't clear if this is because, unlike all the other domesticated animals, pigs have no value outside of slaughter, or if it's because pigs are really dirty, or if it's because pig meat tastes the closest to human meat, or indeed if it was just a cultural thing with no solid basis in practical matters. The early dynastic period seems to have had a time where pigs, though domesticated, became extremely scarce. But with the rise of the Akkadian Empire, pigs came back a bit in popularity. We can measure these things by the bones of the animals that we find in trash heaps indicating what kinds of animals are being eaten. The question of why pigs were so unpopular is one of those which is extensively studied, not so much because we have a lot of data on the question, but because of the persistent fascination with the early Israelites. This is a dynamic we'll be seeing a lot of soon, where the number of words outstrips the amount of data, but really the question of pigs is interesting and deserving of more serious study, study which doesn't appear to be directly forthcoming. After pigs, we're back to some more insects, and the fact that pigs are stuck here between a bunch of different bugs is, is pretty telling. Anyway, for insects, we get a few varieties of ants, some scorpions, crickets, caterpillars, and frogs. 
After that, the rest of this particular word list is body parts, which means we've pretty well rounded out our listing of terrestrial animals that Babylonians cared about. Much like nowadays, most of those insects weren't things that the culture spent a lot of time thinking about, except to avoid them. But our look at animals in general is not complete quite yet. There's other word lists that cover birds and fishes, but thankfully, these are mostly listings of species, and it's pretty hard to match different species of fish to their ancient names, because they're pretty typically mentioned without clear species markers, just listings of this or that kind of fish, and it's like, how do you know which fish is it's a tilapia or a salmon or a catfish? You're just looking at a menu. You don't know what any of that means. But fish, in any case, they're pretty interchangeable. Some live in some places, some live in other places, and some have a better taste than others. But fishing in general was an activity open to pretty much anyone, since everyone in Mesopotamia lived near a river. Down south in the sealand swamps formed by the slowly receding Persian Gulf, fish were a major component of the diet, and for the rest of the people, fish were an occasional treat to balance out the nutritional requirements. Now, personal fishing was often very active, involving spears or a bow and arrow, like you'd shoot a bow and arrow into the river and you'd hit a fish. If I was doing it, I'd miss, but these guys, apparently, they hit their fishes. That said, they also had fishing lines with hooks on them. And while the Egyptians had lines on a stick, kind of like a modern fishing rod, art from Assyria seems to indicate that the Mesopotamian fishermen just held the loose end of a string without any rod. Still, this was just regular people fishing for food and probably for fun, too. Uh, as early as the Sumerian times, we hear about industrial-scale fishing, where a handful of men would get together with nets, either wading into the river or floating on reed boats to catch a lot of fish. And there was actually, sometimes, this was large enough scale that the fishermen had to get government involvement to grant fishing concessions on certain areas of the river. Uh, people could argue about, ah, oh, you're fishing all the river, you're eating all my fish. But how often or how extensive this is, that's unclear. While animals in general were shared with all of the gods, fish in particular were the domain of Ea, the god of the waters, crafting, and magic. Similarly, birds are often hard to differentiate from each other for a lot of the same reasons. There were no domesticated birds until the chicken arrives from the east sometime in the Neo-Assyrian period, while eggs and birds were hunted probably by all classes, but they were a pretty marginal food source overall. So this has been a bit of a ramble, and I was thinking about following it up with a discussion of mythical animals, but I'm not really feeling it right now, so we're going to come back to that. At some point in the future, we're going to talk about... Anzu bird and the dragons and the the funny guy with wings that everybody recognizes from the art So there's a lot of real good stuff in there. We'll get to it at some point in the future instead We're gonna have another ramble next time about the fate of Anatolia in the Bronze Age collapse and the emergence of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms We're not gonna have a lot to say, but I'm gonna fill up a whole episode with it anyway so join us next time for a confusing mess of poorly attested petty princes who nevertheless were kind of important for some people for a couple hundred years. Thank you for listening.